this computer. Hey, Yay, thank you for reminding me. No okay, can you see the, uh, the thing that says rocket science and it has the moon and the stars? Yeah. Okay, this is a program I did about eight or 10 years ago. It, there, I just saw this little contest and I thought this would be cute. They wanted a simulation of, a, of landing a satellite on the moon for educational purposes. And I thought, well, I've done a number of programs like this, and so it should be easy. And I've, I've always wanted to learn JavaScript. So I set to work. I, I threw this together in a month. And uh, this is a little, uh, little program that does a simulation of launching a rocket ship to the moon. So the first step, is uh, uh, you have to design your rocket. And again, this is an, uh, an educational program. And so here's your rocket. And what you can do is set how big it is, how big the various stages are. So you can make the first stage bigger and you see how it gets taller, or you can make it smaller and you can do this second stage or the third stage and you can make the boosters bigger but that increases the cost and the mass which is important let me get this out of the way i can't okay um so anyway this is how you you design your rocket and uh the idea then is that uh, you can make it bigger or smaller but it costs more money and it ends up being heavier, which makes it harder to launch. So that this is easy. It's really, it's just a very simple, whoop, here we go. Let's get Matteo in here. Um, so very simple process. Let's wait for Matteo to get in. Yes. Here he is. Are you there, Matteo? Mateo, can you hear me? Can you, you hear me? Yes, I can hear you. Now. Okay. Okay. I'm showing off a program here as a, a very simple program that we can use as a basis for uh, discussing some simple algorithms. This is a an educational simulation of sending a satellite to land on the moon, and. Uh, have either of you ever heard of an old program called Lunar Lander? No, no I never heard before. Oh, you're so young. <laughs> <laughs> Lunar Lander was, uh, was one of the very first educational games. This was back in oh, 1968 or so. And it was all done with text, but there have been better and better versions over the years and this is a super duper extra special all sorts of extra features expanded version of lunar lander so basically you uh you design your rocket and then when you're ready you click on the next button and you go to the next screen this oh here's yasmina okay oh uh, you know i'm gonna go back start this over uh wait for yasmina to get in uh yasmina are you there now yep i am uh, okay how are you? very good i'm really sorry you guys about my screw up with this it was there's no excuse i just screwed up so uh uh please uh forward my apologies to the other people who weren't able to make it or were somehow messed up by my mistake so okay i'm gonna start off by showing off a program i did about eight years ago it is meant to be an educational simulation of launching a rocket and sending it to the moon and we'll be able to look at some of the algorithms it uses i encourage you at any point if you see something that you don't immediately, that, that you're curious, how did I do that? 
by all means, interrupt me right then and, and ask, how did you do that? And I'll show you the code because in fact, I have all the code right here. So, uh, okay, so here's how it begins and you click anywhere to get going. And your first task is to design the rocket that you're going to send. And it's all very simple. You just uh, click on things to make them bigger or smaller. And uh, uh, let's make the boosters bigger. There we go, bigger boosters. Uh, and that changes the cost of the, pro of the rocket and how heavy it is. By the way, this is only a demo version. I have rigged it so that everything works. Uh, I'm just showing you, demoing the basic uh, characteristics of the design. Okay, once you've designed your rocket, then we go to the next screen. This is the rocket tilt curve. This is, you may have noticed that when a rocket takes off, it doesn't just go straight up. At a certain point, it starts tilting and, or, you know, going off like this. And the question is, should it launch and immediately go like that? Or should it go way up and slowly bend over? Will you get to make that decision? And you make it with this little button here, and you can make it like this. And so the idea is, as you use more and more fuel, it starts off going 90 degrees straight up, but then it'll start tilting over. And at the I, you know that when you've used up all your fuel, you've got to be going horizontally so you can orbit the earth. So really all you're doing, it, this means that uh, when the curve is like this, this means it goes up further before it starts tilting over. And if you go the other way, then it starts tilting, whoops, it starts tilting very quickly. And so this is you know, how quickly you are bending the rocket over. So I will, set that to something like this. Okay, now let's, come on, get out of the way thing. Well, maybe I can click there, there we go. Okay, now, here we go. Here's the actual launch. Now, again, these numbers are rigged to make sure that it will work for the demo version, but in the final version, it's just a matter of turning on some equations. And there are no decisions to make at this point. All we're going to do is launch it and show how high it gets as a function of how far it goes down, down range. So, and it'll show you these numbers over here as it flies. So here we go, launch. And it goes up and it tilts over and off it goes. Uh, I was tempted to break this down into two or three steps so that it doesn't happen so fast so that you can see the low altitude, the medium altitude, and the high altitude. But for this purpose, I just left it the way it is. Um, okay, now, oh, we can replay it if you want. And so this one, it's, it's really tilting over quickly. Okay, now we go to the next. There. Let's go to the next screen. And okay, now it's in a parking orbit going around the Earth. And what we're going to do is, I better pull this down again. What we can do is set or change the point at which it will actually uh, start the, what's called the Transorbital eject injection process. And I'm going to say, okay, burn right there. And poof, it starts the burn and starts shooting out towards the moon. And uh, woo, that was pretty good. Okay. So if I'd started it at some other place, it would have uh, gone off in some other direction. So now we're at the moon. And now we have the landing tilt curve. And again, now it's flying over the moon and you've got, it'll start burning you know, the rocket to slow it down and it'll start dropping, but then you want to tilt it so it'll also 
so that it won't crash into the moon. So I'll set something like this, and then we proceed. And here's our satellite right here. And that's where we want it to land. And let's see how it works. And we see the numbers here. And you can see we're going to fall short. And uh, you can see the vertical speed is still pretty high. Yeah, that's OK. But we're running out of fuel. And let's see. Okay, we touched down with a vertical speed of 2.7 meters per second. Yeah, this was a pretty good landing. Yeah, yeah, that was a pretty good landing. So, uh, but we didn't land where we were supposed to land, so we missed. So, anyway, we can uh, replay it, see the whole thing again. So that's this little toy simulation. By the way, there's an interesting lesson here in designing software for people. This was a contest. Uh, there was an Israeli group that was gonna land a satellite on the moon and they wanted a little educational program to sort of accompany their effort. And so they had this little contest where they said they would give uh, $25,000 to whomever uh, came up with a, a, good a good design, not even working software, just a good design for an educational simulation. And so I just threw this thing together in about a month's time. And I, I just sent it off. I really didn't expect anything to happen because uh, you know, I was, it was really just a way for me to learn how to use JavaScript. And lo and behold, about a month later, I got an email back from him saying, congratulations, you are one of the three finalists for this. Uh, we're going to fly you to New York City and you can present your program or your design and blah, 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 blah. Uh, OK, I suppose so. I have some friends in New York City. It'd be a good chance to see them. So uh, I flew to New York City and uh, gave my presentation. And the interesting thing is that I did not win, which I really didn't expect to, but I was appalled at who did win. What happened was that a group of, of very young people just out of school had put together this proposal that uh, promised all sorts of fabulous things. They said, we're gonna have this and we're gonna have that and we'll have this and that and this and that all sorts of glorious things and wonderful animations, and music, and sound, and so forth. All these promises, nothing working. No actual software, just promises. And uh, I showed my, I was the only one who had any, actually had any software. Both of the other proposals were just people promising wonderful things, but they hadn't actually done anything. I had a complete working program. It still needed tuning and so forth. Anyway, um, the problem is the clients in this case. Clients never know what they want. They, uh, they don't know what software is. They don't know what's possible or impossible. And so they will hit you with all sorts of stupid ideas. And one of your jobs in creating software for clients is to tell them what they can't do, uh, is to make right up front, you know, they'll say, we want it to uh, make the computer bounce. And you have to say, no, that can't be done. Or, you know, they'll want something you have to tell them, no, if you do that, it could be hacked easily and you don't want your software being hacked. Uh, saying no to your clients is always scary because you, uh, you fear they might say, well, if he won't do what we want, we're not gonna hire him. And that's exactly what happened to me. Uh, 
they wanted a feature in it that I told them was a stupid idea. Uh, they wanted to be able to, uh, I won't go into the details, we don't have enough time, but they, they wanted a, a really bad feature. I've been designing games for 30 years at that time. I knew it wouldn't work. I told them, no, that's a bad idea. You don't want to do it. Well, their attitude was, well, if, if Chris doesn't want to do what we need, then we're not going to let him win. So they went ahead with the kids who promised all sorts of nonsense. And uh, the kids got the $25,000 and then did nothing. They never produced any software. It was just a total waste of money. And, you know, that's what happens to software vendors sometimes. Now, maybe I should have been more explained in greater detail. The problem was it would all, ha I had only like 10 minutes to do everything. I just didn't have enough time to explain. But you just, you better be aware of this. This is the kind of thing that happens all the time in software and you just better get used to it. So anyway, so here's the program. Now let me show you some of the code used in it. This is all JavaScript. Uh, let's see, uh, that's a reset, erase. Okay, well, this is very simple. Rotate here. This is just a simple trigonometry thing. Uh, this just, there's nothing interesting there. Set button, move rocket. Okay, this is a re, well, I shouldn't say simple. This is the routine that moves the rocket on the screen uh, when you're flying through space. And let's see, it figures the tilt. And that's just uh, the amount of uh, uh, fuel being burned by the tilt exponent. Where did the tilt exponent come from? Ooh, I'm sorry, this is a global variable. And you're not supposed to use global variables, but I didn't want to have to pass parameters. So I, uh, the fuel, I subtract the burn. The burn rate is how much fuel we're burning every second. And so first we take away the burn rate from the fuel. That is every time we execute this, we're gonna reduce the fuel by a certain amount. Then we start off setting the acceleration to zero. And so long as there's fuel left, that is fuel is greater than zero, then we're going to uh, calculate the result. And so we're gonna reduce the mass by a little bit we start with the initial mass and then we subtract the amount of fuel that's been burned away. And uh, this is the amount, the percentage of fuel that is remaining and the acceleration, how much it slows down or speeds up is equal to the thrust, another global variable, I apologize. The thrust is the result of burning the fuel divided by the mass, which we calculated up here. So then we, we just take the X and Y coordinates and calculate the changes in those coordinates based on, we initialize them to nothing or to 200. And then we put in some safety things that just say, whoa, my numbers have gone crazy. Make them safe. This is, you put a lot of this stuff into your code, these little things that say, oops, if I miscalculated, here's a ceiling and here's a floor and we're not gonna let it go above the ceiling and we're not gonna let it go below the floor. And then we uh, erase the rectangle that had this stuff in it. And uh, we change, we figure the velocities in, in the X direction and the Y direction. And then we change the coordinates by those velocities. And this is all very, this is real simple for a physicist. For you guys, I realize it's not quite that obvious, but, uh, and then we do a rotation just to, because the rocket is rotating slightly. So we do the rotation and, uh, da, 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 da. oh, this is for the launch. Uh, if we move off the page, then we say, okay, we're finished. And then there's just some programming, uh, 
housekeeping. The rest of this is all just more, you know, did he push a button? Which button did he push? Yeah, this is all simple stuff. So really, this is <laughs> uh, all of the code for the launch animation. This is all of the, uh, the algorithms for that. Um, let me see if I can find, oh, there's launch trajectory lunar landing. Uh, I wonder if the parking, oh, I didn't want to do that. I launched. Do, 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 do. Here, I'll, I'll at least make it weird. Let's see if it, okay. Now it should go off in a wild direction. See, now it goes off in a bad direction. Okay, I, but I did not want that one to uh, do, do, do there. Let's go back though. I'm gonna hide this and find it there. What I needed to do is that. This is for that parking orbit where it goes around in a circle. And you can see this is all just, you know, graphic stuff, no real algorithms. Um, yeah, we're just drawing the marker, changing the label. Here, here's how we move the rocket. Uh, ooh, this is a nasty one. He better not try to do this. This is just circular motion. And so it's just doing arc tangent. It's just calculating some trigonometric things, drawing a circle, you know, with uh, <laughs> geometry and all of that stuff. Mm. But again, this is, uh, yeah, this is about the only real algorithm at work there until we fire the rocket and then we go into the translunar injection. And eh, I don't know, here we go. Now this is interesting. We take, we show how the velocity changes based on the gravity of the earth and the gravity of the moon. Only we're modify them by the cosine of the earth angle and the cosine of the moon angle, blah, 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 blah. Again, trigonometry, you learned basic trig. This is an application of the trigonometry you learned in secondary school. So uh, this is what I mean. By, we're talking simple math. Uh, I know it looks hairy, but if you just, I don't know, uh, if you just apply that, it works. So. Let me pause here and ask if there are any questions. Nope. I think I need a wine to understand all of this. I'm personally. sorry. I think I need a wine to understand all of this personally. So yeah, yeah, you may want to uh, just review the video. And then send me an email if you have any questions about it. Um, yeah, that makes sense. Yeah, I, I realize, yes, I'm sort of throwing it all at you. And when it comes at you all at once in a big, you know, it is harder to follow. But if you just go through it step by step and look at each line and think about what it means, I think you should be able to figure out that you can see this is not really complicated stuff. Mm -hmm. So, well, let me move on to another program here. Um, this is, oh, uh, this is from a completely different program called Balance of the Planet. Uh, this I did before rocket science, I believe. Yes, this was in Java. And uh, uh, this is the one where I had all of these different factors. Did I, did I show you last week the big diagram showing all of the arrows connecting all of the different parts of the simulation? Did mm, I show you? No. Uh, let me see if I can easily bring that back up here. Uh, 
Uh, that would be in, no, not ancient source code. There we go, balance of the planet. Let me show the game images. So don't go down, I want to go down first. It's level two. Here's the level three map. Yeah, I'm gonna bring that up. And this shows all of the factors. I'm gonna have to blow it up to normal size. All of the factors that are calculated in the simulation. And so basically all you do you get to raise taxes on four things, gasoline, carbon dioxide emissions, air pollution, or radioactive emissions. And the money you get from that all goes into the piggy bank, which then can be used to affect various subsidies. And you decide how much subsidy you're gonna put into public transport, education, investments in, in capital or in uh, infrastructure, uh, solar energy subsidies or subsidies for scientific research. And those then affect these things, which in turn start affecting these things, which then affect things like energy conservation or the average miles per gallon of cars, price of energy, and uh, the very prices and the price of energy then affects the amount of production of nuclear energy, coal, oil, natural gas, solar energy, wind energy, or geothermal energy, or hydroelectric energy, which then affects net energy production and a bunch of other things, which affects global gross domestic product and economic growth, but it also reduce, produces net CO2 emissions, which affect the average global temperature, and there's also agricultural productivity, which affects food production, which in turn affects rainforest clearing and malnutrition deaths, which result, which affects the number of poor people who die, number of rich people, of poor people who die are like in Africa, rich people who die are in Europe and America, and then there's a score for the environment itself, the quality of life, which affects your annual score, which affects your total score. And so you can see there are all of these factors that are all interconnected and it looks horrible. And it really isn't that bad because each of the individual arrows is actually a pretty small equation. Uh, for example, let's see if we can find average miles per gallon because it comes only from uh, energy conservation. So I'm gonna hide this and uh, I'll go way back up and let's just search for that. Oop. Oh, sorry, try again. Oh, why am I missing it? Find again, there it is. Here's average miles per day. Here's where I calculate it. And I look up the conservation, the amount of energy conservation that's going on. And then there's a coefficient that I look up. This is a number that I have stored in the, uh, uh, in the resource file for the program. And then I get the original value of miles per gallon. And then I say, well, the result is equal to the original miles per gallon multiplied by the conservation amount, multiplied by the co coefficient, poof. That's all there is to it. Conservation amount and coefficient are both percentages. So we take the original miles per gallon and multiply by the percentage of conservation we're doing. And then we multiply by just a, 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 a calibration coefficient it's called. Uh, anyway, that scales it to a certain amount and that's our result. That's how we get average miles per gallon. That's all there is to it. Uh, here's another one, transportation needs. Uh, that has two inputs, global gross domestic, gross domestic product. That is the richer the world gets, the more people want transportation. Um, and then there's the energy price. Well, if energy is really expensive, it's gonna cut back on the demand for uh, transportation. 
So we again get our page coefficient, the, the multiplying coefficient value. And then we take the, that coefficient, the rate, and we multiply it by GDP. And then we get the original value of energy price and divide by the current price. So that if the current price is much higher than the original price, then uh, this will be higher than this, which means these two numbers together will be less than one. So that means because the price of energy has gone up, the demand for transportation has gone down. That's all there is to that. You can see these really are fairly simple equations. Now, again, you're gonna ask me, yeah, where'd you get that equation? And the answer is, I made it up. You know, all by myself, I just said, that's what the equation will be. And I want to encourage you to do that kind of thing, um, not because it's correct, but because it's a hell of a lot better than anything else out there. Um, that is, uh, this is not a, uh, a formal you know, proof of what's going on. This is an educational product. This is what scientists call a first approximation. That is, it's a first draft. It's your, your very first idea of how it would work. And so, uh, sure, it's, it's not perfect. We can make it better. And so if anybody were to you know, challenge me on this and say, hey, wait a minute, Chris, how do you know that's right? My answer is, if you have something better, let's see it. Um, you know, we can always make these things more accurate. The problem is nobody does it in the first place because everybody's scared of doing it. You got to start somewhere. So throw something together and then get some criticism on it, whatever. Uh, so anyway, this is how we, we do these things. Here's electric car use and uh, need. Oh, here we go, yeah. Uh, the need for electric car use is equal to how much transportation is needed minus the amount of public transport that people are using. So if we need a lot of transportation, well, public transpo uh, transport will take away from that. And whatever is left over, we'll say, we'll go to, uh, uh, oop, no, I'm sorry. We've also got gasoline in there. Yeah. Ooh, this is a more complicated one. Oh, yeah. That's an interesting, that's a little tricky. So, and then here's gasoline use. Anyway, so these are some sample uh, uh algorithms. This is going to be one of the more complex ones. And uh, ah, yes, very good. I, uh, I used to have consideration for conservation uh, subsidy, but I took that out. And I'm not sure why. Yep. Oh, well, I can figure it out later. Here's scientific progress. Did I do this with a Yes, I used a logarithm right here. To -de -do -de -do. This is complicated math. <laughs> this is as complicated as it can get. Uh, basically, I uh, uh, log of multiplier times research over divider. Multiplier is the, yeah, yeah. See, it's based on educational level. If you got a more educated population, you get better science. And that's the coefficient there, so, okay. So, I don't know, any questions on those algorithms? It's a lot, here, let me demonstrate. This is a lot of algorithms, um, but it's, uh, they're all very simple, uh, so, yeah, you can see lots of algorithms. 
all very simple, but ultimately they, uh, they all interact. And I will warn you that in a large simulation like this, where you got a million factors all interconnected, there is the problem of runaway. Um, you don't realize it, but if this number here, whoops, I didn't mean to do that. If this number here gets a little too big, then this will get even bigger, which will cause that to explode, which will cause this to go way down, which will, you know, you get a, what's a runaway situation. And you just, you just tune it. You know, you go through, you run it once and you say, oh my God, it blew up. And then you, you know, pat down some things. You make these numbers a little smaller, those numbers a little bigger, try it again. Uh, that was really where I spent most of my time with this project, getting it tuned so that all the different factors, no matter what you did, it wouldn't blow up on you. You would definitely get some results, but nothing crazy. So again, questions. How do you test all these algorithms? It's uh, very difficult and time spending, I think. Uh, theoretically, you should have lots of testers who are trying all sorts of different things. In practice, <laughs> I didn't need to do that because I know you are always the best tester because you know what's going on inside there. So you can come up with the nastiest tests. That is, you'll, you'll have some pretty good guesses as to where it might blow up. And so you can poke at those and, and fiddle around with them. Uh, yes, you still have to do a lot of testing. You play it and play it and play it and play it. And uh, you try all sorts of variations. And it is true that no matter what you do, there are always some things you're gonna overlook. Um, and and that, for that, you do need outside testers. So first you do your own testing with, you know, with, by yourself. And that should get you into the general area of a workable simulation. Then, you bring in a few trusted people. Um, it's best if you bring in colleagues, people who know, who are at, who understand this stuff the way you do. And so the last people you want are normal consumers, because they're gonna, uh, if they do find a problem, they want, be able to tell you what it is. They'll say, whoa, well, I pushed the button, the red button, and then the screen went black. And you, what do you mean? What happened? And they cannot describe the problem very well. So try to avoid using uh, amateur testers. You need good testers who, who know how to poke and find the right spots. And you also need uh, uh, testers who can explain exactly how to find the problem. By the way, this is called, uh, oh darn it, uh, uh, precise bug reports. Uh, you know, above all, they have to make, they have to describe it well enough to be reproducible. Uh, here's a, an acronym for you to learn, CNR. C N R, which means can not replicate. Uh, in other words, the tester comes to you and says, well, I, I, did, I did this and then it looked green. And you can't figure out, you've got to be able to replicate the bug by, to do exactly the same steps he did that produced the bug. And if his description is too vague for you to be able to reproduce it, then CNR. So you need to find people who will tell you exactly what is wrong. 
other questions? Okay. Uh, let's see, what else do I have? Ooh, gossip. This one, ooh, this one is kind of, these algorithms are, are more difficult to understand. I'll, I'll try to explain this. Here is a place, uh, here's a, fun, oh, gossip. This is a, uh, a game. Uh, if you want to do a personality modeling game, this is, you should probably build a gossip game first. Very simple concept. There are a bunch of people talking by telephone. And so one person calls another person and says, wow, that guy over there, he's a real jerk. And uh, then this guy says, oh no, I think he's a really great guy. And so they share their opinions and then they hang up and two other people call. It's a very basic concept, uh, and uh, uh, there are a million ways to do it. Uh, this is one that I did about maybe 10 years ago. Um, let's see. Here is just one algorithm in it. This algorithm uh, makes the plan for one speaker to tell a listener about a third party. So th this person here, and he's specified by an index, speaker number three is gonna call listener number, is gonna call person number six. And first thing he's gotta do is, oh, wait a minute, where'd predicate come in? Uh, oh, I'm sorry. This assumes that this person, predicate, has already been selected. In other words, speaker, I wonder, I'm gonna go back and find this. Do, 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 do. Uh, there. Uh, oh boy. Oh dear, this is gonna be really nasty to explain because predicate is the guy we're talking about uh, but he is apparently specified beforehand let me make sure that predicate is in fact a global variable i've always had a uh, very bad habit um, yeah There it is. Oh, there it is. Okay, well, anyway. Um, yeah, predicate is specified there. So very bad, very bad. Lots of phases. History. Come on, Chris. Let's get to the point here. Do, 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 do. Declare affinity. Ooh, that's even worse. Suspicious. Oh, yeah. This is a, a routine here that calculates how suspicious a comment is. In other words, if I tell you, uh, you know, Mary is very untrustworthy, but you know that Mary is very trustworthy then you're gonna be suspicious. Why is he lying to me? And that turns out to be important, but the calculations for that, as you can see, are pretty messy. So uh, getting back to plan direct report. So what we're gonna do here is, first we're gonna calculate the true affinity that the speaker has for the predicate, the person we're talking about. And then we're gonna figure out what the listener wants me to say. So this is what I really feel, but this is what I believe that my listener, whoops, sorry, sorry, that my listener feels about the predicate. Okay, so uh, I know how I feel and I know how you feel, 
and I don't want to contradict what you feel because if I if you like Mary and I say Mary is a creep that's not going to be good you're going you're going to feel badly you're not going to like me so I I got to somehow compromise between the truth and what uh, you want to hear. But I'm, and so I'm going to mix the two together. And first, I'm going to bias that by first, how dishonest I am. If I'm a very dishonest person, oh, yeah, I'm going to, I'm going to bias it a lot. And then the second thing is how much I like the listener. If I really like the listener, notice that this is a negative, then um, I'm going to, I'm going to be more honest. Uh, with, I'm more honest with my friends. And then I make a, an adjustment for the difficulty level. The, the more difficult this, this game is, the more biased it'll be. And then finally, I blend together the true feelings I have combined with what I know you want to hear biased towards the lie value by the amount of the bias that I've set up. So that's an application of the blend operator, which is somewhere down here. So, so let me open up. I wonder if, no, we don't want to get into that one. This is, this is Le Mort d'Artour. No, this is too complicated. So, uh, no, no, there. Oh, this is a real old, oh, this is Seaboot. We'll go back to, uh, to gossip. Uh, so those are some of the algorithms. I'm sorry I was, uh, I, I really searched around. I've, I've got a lot of programs I've done, but unfortunately there are very few where an algorithm sits all by itself in a nice little package where you don't have to worry about anything else around there. And these were some of the ones that I did find that are partially understandable. Um, Again, you can go through the video, and if you have any questions about any specifics, just send me an email. But any other questions right now? Okay, well, let me uh, stop screen sharing here. There we are, we're back to normal. Well, final comments, discussions, whatever, anything you want to know. I mean, we are, we are done with the course now. So anything else you'd like to talk about? Uh, hi, sorry if uh, I can't turn on my camera, but uh, right now it's impossible for me. Uh, anyway, I just uh, wanted to say uh, general comment uh, on the course uh, and basically I wanted to say thank you and uh, also I found it uh, very interesting especially uh, obviously I can say that uh, I understood everything about programming and coding because uh, uh, I did it but in a very limited way but for sure uh, it helped me you, uh, Chris, helped me a lot to understand better uh, how it works and also especially rather than coding the logic of uh, algorithms and uh, how uh, how they work. So that's it. I'm very happy with, the, with this course. I found it interesting and uh, useful. Well, that raises a question in my mind. I have never, <clears throat> I've never attempted to teach this aspect of design, which I think you could probably guess, given the fact that I really uh, struggled trying to communicate these ideas. Um, how useful do you think 
this stuff is? I mean, would it have been better if I talked about other aspects of software design? Or do you feel like uh, really? No, it's um, just the fact of uh, how, for example, mathematics can be implemented, uh, rather just uh, not the software, just uh, uh, how, for example, mathematics can implement it and uh, also how to read some uh, formulas. Because, uh, for example, uh, it happened that uh, I had to check uh, a code. Uh, but uh, was it able to understand the, the mathematic part of or how it is implemented? So um, I I don't know if I explained myself well, because, uh, but uh, uh, let's see. I think you should teach this kind of stuff more often to more people. I'm, I'm actually surprised you're like the first persons to um, to actually attend this kind of class with you, but because personally, I've always been into like the more visual side of uh, anything like film or, or game design. So this is all very new to me. So, and this is and the main reason I wanted to take this class because this is like new territory and I wanted to have like, to be introduced to, to these kind of things. But also, I've also noticed that after taking your classes, I've begun to be more critical and more analytical in, um, in uh, when I see like when I play a game or like in general, the, the mechanics of like or a playthrough or anything. And I actually notice when, for example, you say that some things can be kind of repeated or they're not like well thought of. And like, I remember everything you have said and I noticed them and I'm like, yeah. <laughs> good, good, because you can't really be a good designer until after you've learned how to criticize the mistakes other people make. And there's a lot of really bad software out there. I get. And they're very repeated as well. Like I noticed like this mechanism and I'm like, wait, this is the same in this game and this game and this game. They just like change some stuff and like, oh. Yeah. Oh, my yeah. God. yeah. So I, I get very angry sometimes at the stupid mistakes that that I see. And uh, uh, by all means, that, that's a good way to learn by, by seeing other people's mistakes uh, so that you don't make the same mistakes. So, uh, Leonardo, uh, yeah. do you feel like this build a gap? that needed to be filled? Yeah, it was very interesting to see how the numbers can uh, represent the reality of things in general and how we can express art inside uh, any kind of software uh, through um, how we can implement those numbers and algorithms in, in there. Uh, because that's uh, how our vision of the world could be implemented in, uh, in an interactive software, for example. Uh, it was very nice to, to know about that and also uh, to know your opinion about the arts and uh, the engineering in general, <laughs> the two contrast to constant, the two uh, opposite words. Okay. Well, I have a request for you. I'm going to ask a favor from you. I will probably try to teach another course like this at some time. And I, I'm really groping here. I really, you could tell I, I was making it up as I went along and didn't quite know how to teach it well. So I would like each of you to write me some suggestions for how I could do a better job next time. That is, what types of things do I need to put more time into? What types of things did I talk about too much? Um, what types of things, what kinds of questions did you have that I never even addressed? You know, things that were going on in your mind and, and I never even talked about it. Uh, it. Think in terms of future students. What will future students need that was or wasn't in this course? 
So what can you say that will help me do a better job with future students? Noted. Okay, I would very much appreciate that. And uh, good luck with you. You're presenting your, uh, your projects in a few weeks. What, Lake Cuomo? Um, yes, Cuomo it's, uh, next week. Uh, I'm sorry, sorry, Yasmina. Oh, no, it's fine. No, Monday we have a play test in, in the ELO conference in Como, so we're going to have that. And last time we had actually a play test between like us students. And then in a couple of weeks, we're going to give like a final due, but it's not like next week. So. Well, good luck with that. Sounds like both scary and fun. So. <laughs> Okay, then. Well, it's been lots of fun chatting with you guys, and uh, I wish you the best of luck, and I look forward to your suggestions on how I can do a better job next time. Thank you Thank so you. much, Chris. Okay. Thank you very much. Bye-bye. Bye. Yeah. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye, -bye. Bye.